Yeah, remember the name Jazz Tech all best in the game Mob and mentality in his own lane So better pay attention to what he be saying Get the message, ain't no question Giving advice for any investment Welcome to the broadcast The Jazz Tech all podcast Alright, I'm sitting here with Mr. Bradley Watson You're up to so many things So let me see if I get this right Awesome kick-ass podcast host yourself um awesome kick-ass real estate broker here in the city of toronto greater toronto area for my out of town out of province out of country listeners that's generally a a 50 mile slash 75 kind of 75 kilometer radius um you you know what you're what you're up to through your podcast and being such a like a guy that's really into the market you're also and i don't even know if you know this but your name's spoken about a lot in the real estate community with realtors um which you know i've i'm very blessed to be living that as well from the perspective of sometimes you don't know who's listening to these things you know what i mean like to these podcasts are you know watching and if you haven't yet because I know my team is is always reminding me I don't talk about the new app. Um, if you're watching this full video, you're already watching it on the the all new Jazz Tacker app, which you can download um, in the App Store and the Play Store. But if you're listening while you're taking your dog for a walk right now, or you're uh, on a treadmill and you actually want to see this handsome face, I'm not talking about myself for once. I am talking about Bradley. Um, what I would strongly recommend is get on your phone and download this app it's where all my exclusive podcast videos are my exclusive keynotes as well as as well as content when i'm featured on other people's podcasts which i'm grateful because i was featured on yours what's the name of the podcast uh, we were Bradley. talking about content. It's episode 295. It's episode two. Wow. Well, you actually remember it. I, I, I do a little bit of homework before you're, I show you're, up. You're, you're good to go. Unforgettable, buddy. my friend. I like but that. I am taken, unfortunately. Okay. And I got to be honest, I don't do a lot of homework before. Um, and and, and I, I say that with full transparency because I actually, from a selfish perspective, just want to get to know you, get to know what's working uh, for you, what's not working well. I know we were talking like 13 seconds off air and then the team shut us up because they're like, get this stuff on air. Um, just real stories that you're going through, right? And and I do that because if I do, me personally, this is me, if I do too much homework, then, then I'm not gonna be as curious and then the guys and gals that are watching and listening, they don't get to be a real-time fly on the wall. And so that's the way that I go. I, I mean, you did a fantastic job hosting me um, and the podcast is everywhere iTunes, oh, yeah, Spotify, man. just yeah, search yeah. it. If you look up Jazz Tacker, I'm a couple right below your, if my podcast with you is right below your podcast. Okay, on well, iTunes. but more importantly, your podcast. Like, I, I just want them yeah. to get yours. Sure. Um, real estate agents, uh, home buyers, home sellers, investors, like, you got to download this. I mean, I'm, I'm all about collaboration over competition. There's 6.6 .6 million people in the GTA. Um, I'm not going to get to all of them. And I have a feeling you're not going to get to all them. And so at least if you're getting good information coming from a source that that knows what he's talking about, um, I'm more than happy if you all my listeners go over to you because I think that's huge. But Bradley, let's let's let let's go back a little bit. OK, sure. let's go back. Um, how did you get in this business and why? So I guess the question is, what's the business? If the business is real estate, then uh, it started back out of college, university. I was. Um, I don't know, a young guy, around 22 years old. And again, the listeners school. can't see this guy, like he's saying, you know, I'm a young guy. He looks like he just came out of university How old or college do you think a couple of years. How'd you, how'd you bet now? Well, now because- uh, I just kind of I cheated a little. Yes, what did you say? Give me a number. Yes, is 32? 32, yeah. Very good. Very good. I'm turning yeah. 32 this year. Oh, I am wow. Young. I am wow. young. But if you think this baby face is young, you should see my for sale signs when I started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What 22 like years 12? old. 12? <laughs> and exactly. Yeah. And not to mention, I mean, you, you know, through the real estate courses, the demographic of the real estate program is second career. That's what it is. No one, for everyone outside of this business, no one grew up wanting to be a real estate agent yeah, like that yeah, you, exactly. you fall into this business yes. and unfortunately and i mean this in the most kind possible way there's 76,000 real estate agents in that 50 mile 75 kilometer radius that like look majority of them are part time 
right? And and that's why it's so important for you as a viewer and a listener, when you're in the market, buying, selling, investing, and I think you and I are going to go more down the investing route because most of my listeners are that. There, there is some first-time home buyers and all that kind of stuff, but most are investors, that you need to make sure you're getting information from people who are actually doing it as well themselves. But continue, buddy. Yeah, so I I mean, I guess a little backstory. I have no issues with being in the public light. When I was at Humber, I was the vice president of student council. So that was an elected position. You know, we were the Brad administration, the vice pres- president of administration at the time. So like, I like, like being out there. I don't think I'm out there just for publicity. I think, honestly, I would rather just do what I love and let people be a part of that journey. And that's kind of been my approach to everything I've done. But yeah, in a sense, I stumbled into real estate in that I was looking at getting into banking. I wanted to get into sales. And that was one of the things holding me back from getting into anything was I didn't have, quote unquote, sales experience. What are you doing at the bank? At the bank. So so I actually never got into the bank. So I was set up to become a commercial. I had con- So make a long story longer. I met with Patricia Lovett Reed, who is the uh, she was at the time the VP of uh, Waterhouse, uh, TD Waterhouse. She was a des- she was a, a dignitarian or one of the people that they brought in as part of the, the graduations for some of the students. So I actually met her because I was through the Board of Governors at the school. So just involvement, talked to her. So she hooked me up with TD and the hiring managers there. So I was essentially waiting for a rotating program associate uh, position at TD that the year that I graduated disappeared. So tried to get into RBC commercial, then I moved into uh, insurance. And so because I wasn't happy with where I was at, I wanted to keep learning and I was probably going to do that anyways. And so real estate was the, the avenue for me to, to learn. And, and learn in terms of getting into the market from like an investor's perspective or was it the sales that, the sales aspect that kind of drove Honestly, you? sales is not exciting to me. Okay. Um, in the sense of real estate, buying, selling houses, even going and looking at pretty houses isn't, isn't sexy to me. Got it. I love the investing side. And so, I mean, as we go along, eventually I get into content creation and I realize that it's investing is the reason that I got my license in the first place. It wasn't to sell at all. It's funny, eh? Because my guys know that, like, I got, I've always worked myself up the sales ladder, like, a little different than you. It's why I have this red phone right here. Like it's, it's like, I love sales, but I actually got into real estate more because I thought the course at, it wasn't at Humber at that time. It was um, pretty much online or, or like Aria, course, Aria um, 17 years ago, almost 18 now that, that I thought they were going to teach me how to invest. Like that's why I actually got my license. It yeah. wasn't really to be a real estate agent. I knew there was one more rung on the ladder of sales that I didn't like conquer for a lack of a better word. But I actually was just like, look, I'm happy in car sales. I was doing that for three years. Um, and so I, like I mentioned, like different from you, I actually thought that it was going to teach me. And then I quickly learned, shit, this is to become more of a real estate agent so you don't get sued, that's right? It, How long ago did you do it? How long ago did I finish the licensing? I think I'm around 10 years in the business. Nice. So de- good decade. I mean, there you go, 32, 22. There you go. Yeah, 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 right yeah. So. Um, here's where I would kind of want to go today um, because you said a couple of things and I'm like, okay, like how, how am I going to frame this? Hmm. Number one, let's just talk about investing into real estate in the greater Toronto area. Sure. Because we're both GTA people. Sure. Um, born and raised here, by the way? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, just want to get a little bit of your backstory. Want to speak to investors. Okay. Yep. And then, and then we'll talk about what content creation has done for you sure. because the other 50% of my viewers and listeners right now are real estate, more real estate agents, mortgage advisors, um, as well as just salespeople slash like, you know, uh, 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 entrepreneurs. And so the importance of content creation, how you put yourself out there, all the stuff that comes with that, I think that's going to be like, it's going to really land for a lot of people. Let's talk about investing. At the time of this recording, we're sitting here now, um, September, guys. Wow. Okay, that was that happened quick. Um, September 2022. Okay. Um, so you guys might be listening to this sometime in November or whatever it may be. Okay. The team will do this in 2022 for sure. I know that. But at the time of this recording, this day, literally 15 minutes ago, okay, the 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 Bank of Canada increased the the rates by uh, 0.75. I don't want to talk too much about what this specific increase has done. Let's talk high level because you and I now a decade in, we have seen 
we have seen rates go up and down. We have seen values go up and down. We work with a lot of investors. I'm going to say 90% of my organization's business is with investors, right? So we do a lot when it comes to investing in, in real estate as you do. When values go up and down, when rates go up and down, how do you talk some of your people off the ledge? Because <laughs> my phone's about to go off the hook the second we're done this recording because all my cl- a lot of my clients are either from the from the school of thought of of jazz like i'm gonna lose my shit i don't know what to do mm-hmm. or some of my more savvier people are gonna look at this as opportunity look i'm not here to tell you that that you should only be looking at this as an opportunity and you should be aggressive because if that's not in your nature don't do that but how, what's your kind of thought process and, 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 and how you talk people off the ledge right now? There, there, if there's a ledge, it's a ledge of opportunity. And, and that, that sounds so like... A play on words. Way I get too cliche. So let's it. move on from that. Yeah. Um, for anyone who knows me, I got three kids. that keep me looking young. And um, old. so right now, the first was born in 2017. These are, these are historic uh, times in real estate. <laughs> yeah. 2017. 2020 and 2022. Okay. I just have a three and a half month old. Congratulations, bro. Thank you. So what's ironic is every year I have a kid, the market crashes. So lucky for everyone in the room, this is, that's it. I'm done. But at the same time, what I've noticed is those are all years when my business did the best. And that was actually where I started from is I noticed every time I have a kid, my business does really well. And when you say business, I just want to make sure that everybody understands. You're talking about your real estate practice. All of it. It's all. Even your it. investment portfolios. Yes. Okay. I want to make sure yes. that they, they know yes. what we're talking about. Yeah. Because, and this is where I love content creation, apart from just being in the limelight, is it's an opportunity to communicate what's going on to people. Um, we have a ton of guests come on and, and um, I actually find the most downloaded episodes are the ones with just me talking about what's going on in the market because people don't care about me. They just love that I love the market and they do too. So why those have been so successful for me in um, whether that's a real estate as a salesperson, the number of transactions, because right now we know sales are down, but then why am I doing well? And it all comes back down to is like, you have to be clear with what's going on. I think right now we're in the middle of something, but in 2020 is a perfect example. That's actually when my podcast started and absolutely took off because it was explaining to people what was going on in the market and being able to communicate that. I did reach out to clients and said, wait, I, I pulled back all my business. A lot of active clients, I said, you got to just stop. And I, this could be six months. This could be a year. But within a month, I was on the phone again saying, guys, this is the time. Because the drop happened so sudden. What did you see? I saw, so I like to track, the TREB numbers are always too late. Even right now, we can, without getting into specifics, so you can see movements that are happening in the market. The sales and new listening ratio is a perfect indicator. Months of inventory is too long. It's too late. But you can see the activity and whether we're moving into a buyer's market, a seller's market. And you can also, what I felt like um, as an example in 2017 and then again in 2020 was that there was a there was an all around agreement that we want this market to crash. Like there was kind of, in 2017, it was a perfect example of the stress test. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a perfect um, smoke and mirrors to crash a market that there were various levels of government were trying to do anyways. You also so, have the fair housing plan that came in. <laughs> spring of 17 ish right right so there there was it was only a matter of time um so i actually sold my i guess this would have been my second property in oshawa and closed a month prior to the, the, the drop in 2017 so that would have been april 2017 so anyways all of this to say with a finger as much as it's like time in the market is better than timing the market i love to time the market and it's just like why not? Why not be aware on what's going on? And I think the information in many ways is just a few of them is just so readily available. Mm-hmm. It, like even just from our shows and conversations, people are not hiding this conversation. It's mm-hmm. just finding the right insight mm-hmm. and then applying it to your business. So for me, just being a, a voice for what's going on, explaining it to people and not being afraid to say, don't do it. Or now's the time to do it. People trust that and they'll, and they'll eventually they'll catch on. And then that's when you start getting the best calls, right? Thank you. I was, I, was, I was wondering what to do. I made the move during this time. And that, that is worth it. Like, that's really the best part. You said a couple of things, brother, um, that I want to unpack. Number one is um, that you like to time the market. And mm-hmm. um, I am one of those people that say, look, it, at the end of the day, I'm one of the most boring investors ever because all I do is just put time in the market. I buy something, I 
rent it out. I let the values do what the values do. They go up and down. I don't lose sleep over any of this stuff. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of it's paper money anyways, right? Until you actually pull out or in terms of selling or pull out some equity. But how do you go about timing the market? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough talking to so many viewers because everyone's coming at it from a different perspective, sure. right? Like one guy calls me and says, I got nine condos and I'm freaking out because low rises are climbing so fast and I'm sitting here wondering what's going on. Well, that same gentleman I was talking to a month or two before the collapse, specifically in the detached segment of, you know what, I, you know what, it's, it's overinflated, you'll be fine. And um, now maybe things have started shifting in the market today, but at the moment that information was relevant to him. So I look at it really broad, but I like to kind of specifically look at different segments. A lot of the numbers that are published can be thrown off. Like if the number of sales are happening in the condo space, your average sales is a useless stat. When, when, 27, when 2020 happened, this was a big part that I wrote on and explaining what was going on is we weren't supposed to be looking at sales. We were supposed to be looking at specific um, segments and what proportion of sales are happening. And there was a lot more sales happening in markets that at that time were in the detach, which is inflating it. And when the detached or the luxury market started saying, hey, we got to back off, it immediately dropped a lot of the prices where you didn't see that across the board if you go by what what Treb calls the HPI index. And the HPI index was kind of that. Was for a I lot just wanna make sure it's like we don't throw too much jargon only because my yeah, guys might not know. Sure. Um, how, uh, uh, house price index, yes, go yeah. on. So, and, and explaining that to people I think was the light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of people in 2020 were devastated, especially in, even in the real estate industry. Like I'm trying to explain to my clients, it's a good time to invest because it's always a good time to invest, but I don't feel like it is. So having the conversation about how HPI was really the true number and, and Treb started kind of trying to redirect, but it, at the end of the day, they're trying to, the, the, the newspapers are trying to make headlines, but if you go a little bit below, you don't have to go that far. You'll start to see the moving parts. Let's talk about uh, house, uh, the, the, the house by, uh, price index. Mm. Explain to my guys what it really is. Sure. So house price index essentially breaks down housing prices by segment. So if you're going to own a one bedroom condo, you don't care what the average price is in Toronto. You care what the average price is of condos. One in my bedroom condos. One well. bedroom condos yes. in my neighborhood. And the HPI index does that. Yeah. And, and it, it, it um, goes based off of a, a, a date. I don't know what it is. 1988 or something, some random arbitrary date. I think it was like the early 90s or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and, they, and it's actually relatively new. Like yeah. it's not, Treb hasn't been like giving that, like they didn't come out with the house pricing index. I think it was only up until like about seven years ago, I think it came out ago. There's right? nothing, yeah, there's nothing sexy about the HPI. Right, <laughs> nothing sexy about it, but I actually completely agree because I'm all about like diving into yeah. comparative market analysis and doing, but most people go by street or they go by kilometer, like, you know, like a radius of a couple of kilometers. You want to compare apples to apples. And the only way to really do that is through what you call the HPI. For, for real estate professionals, when so, this is what how they're seeing it practically in their business. They'll have someone come up and say, oh, I hear the real estate market is crashing. But when you know what that person has in their portfolio and you know, no, it's not, not for you. That's them indirectly recognizing the HPI of that particular segment, but then getting washed by the public news of housing prices are doing this or that. They're crashing, they're rising 30%. You don't see that play out in the same way in HPI in every segment. And like even right now, we have a disproportional change in the detached versus the condos that can only be seen in something like the HPI. Well, look, I think even for real estate agents that are listening right now, when you do get that question at a cocktail party, like how's the market? Yeah. I think one thing that you need to do is, is is just quickly ask the person who's asking you, are you asking from a home buyer's perspective, a home seller's perspective, or an investor's perspective, right? Yeah, because yeah. to your point, I mean, everyone's portfolios are different and some people don't even have a portfolio. They're just looking to, like they own their first home. They just maybe bought at the peak of the market and they're wondering. And so for you as a real estate agent, you need to know who you're speaking to and from what perspective. And then I think is the only way that you can actually give them some type of advice after backing it up with actual facts, right? And 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 talking about, look, if, if, if a home seller comes to you and they ask you, how's the market, but they're not thinking of selling. I mean, you just need to, calm them down and let them know that, look, this, this, this shit has been going on for over a hundred years. Values go up and down upwards over time. It's just a matter of where you're at at the market. 
Yeah. And, and when we're talking about investing, it's also such a broad thing, right? Like for me, I, I keep it very simple and I look at residential and multi-residential. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't stray beyond that. So for me, I can follow, I can get away and a lot of my listeners with just understanding what the market is doing and recognizing. I mean, obviously you got differences in commercial side, but generally it follows a similar pattern and that allows me to simplify it for myself and for our viewers. I know there's a lot of really good commercial podcasts too. Um, but let's start, let, let's dive yeah. into the residential and multi-res. I mean, I got uh, my last, I don't know, maybe five, six episodes, seven episodes out of like three of them were all with guys and gals that kind of heavily are in multi-res. Yeah. So let's just talk about what you said, like when you said residential, like, yeah, and, yeah. and, and w what's your portfolio kind of consist of and what do you like in the, just in the residential sector and, and, and I... I decipher kind of multi-res like five and above doors. I don't know if that's what, is that how you, okay, same that's thing. That's the way the math does it. That's that, well, how the yeah, government does it. Well, hundred percent. So, so yeah. I just, so we go, so when you say residential, what are you four talking and less. about? Four and less. Four and less. And single family, in my opinion, is a write-off. Okay. In, overall, as far as an investment vehicle, at least here in the GTA. It's been since pretty much I've started. It, and, and, and what do you mean by that? Okay. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's a couple ways you make money in real estate. There's three ways, right? You get cash flow, you get equity, and you get mortgage pay down. I'm gonna keep it really simple. Um, equity, condos can do, right? And so can single family or multifamily, low rise. Now the problem gets in is you wanna be able to capitalize on all of these things. Mortgage pay down is becoming a bigger issue now for people that have these you know, creative structures with variable rates, and now they feel like they're not even paying down the mortgage. So that's another whole other issue that people hopefully aren't getting tied up in, but it's probably part of the stress. But then this cash flow component to me is so important to the point where the GTA for a lot of investors isn't even a viable option anymore. I still believe in cash flow. I believe you can still pull out creatively cash flow in and around and outside of the GTA. And that's kind of what I look for. And but as far as condo goes, we're, we're. And when you say cash flow, and we'll go back and forth in that sense, Bradley, but when you say cash flow, are you looking for just rental income covering all your expenses? Or no, is there a number you got, look like, I need a, G, a G note a month. I need yeah. two grand a month. What's kind of your well, a number? G note would be nice, but we're talking but, anything at this point yeah. would be ahead of the curve. Yeah. Um, I don't settle and I, I, a lot of the people that I kind of guide, the, my sheep, if you will, I don't, I don't, I really don't encourage people to go in covering expenses. Yep. And then, and then really bank on, you know, I'm paying down equity and so I'm technically ahead. That There's a lot of that. And I, I'm not an advocate of that. I think that in a market like this, yep. you're realizing why. Yeah, look, I mean, and, and, and I think we can agree to disagree in some, in, in, in some aspects. And I think it's good for the viewers and listeners as well to see a couple of different points, uh, points of view. I think there's, you know, for, for, for somebody who's never invested, I actually think one of the most passive ways to get into the market is going down a pre-construction condo route, right? Um, the truth of the matter is I have clients and myself who have grown a pretty substantial portfolio, um, not only investing in pre-construction, like, that, like that's not, or just investing into a condo, but over time, even in a market like this, like right now, I'm gonna say out of, out of 11 properties that are rented in my portfolio, I'm about to probably be negative cash flow by about 100 to 150 bucks, maybe call it 200 on like five, six of them, okay? Um, now, for me, that doesn't really affect me long term because I can carry it. I, I have no issue carrying it. I'm going to probably not buy as many Starbucks for a little bit. I can cut my expenses here and there. Um, where when I've been through this in the past, and I'm talking out of experience, I've seen my values come right back up again. The rents have increased as well for the buildings that you know, I bought that are built after November 15, 2018, I'm actually able to increase the rents, yeah. right? Um, for me to get into the greater Toronto area, I had to go down yeah. the route of, of going kind of single family, um, which, means, which means just even a home that you just rent out. Um, when I was talking about rental income covering expenses, I did want to make sure I clarified myself as well that like, I'm also speaking about building in your 5% for repairs and maintenance and vacancies, like building all that in, not just saying, let me cover my mortgage payment, my insurance, my maintenance fees or, and, and, and property tax. So I think that if you wanted to get into the greater Toronto area, that overall, I actually think it's still the best place to invest into, but that's just, again, that's my biased opinion, right? Yeah. I, um, I bleed GTA um, because I just like the fact that I, 
like there's 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 going to be whatever the numbers are being thrown around now in the next call it three to four years in Canada. There's going to be a million people coming. Historically, we know fifty percent of them are coming into the GTA. So I know the steady flow of tenants. Right now, you're also quite hot on on Hamilton, I believe. Right? Because any outskirt community, my mind is again, this is a pursuit of cash flow. Yeah. Anywhere you can pull cash flow, I, I like Niagara region. That's kind of where I've been dancing. I did the I did the East End, and the four hundred one kills me. Maybe when we get another highway, that'll speed me up. I'll go back. Yeah. But I, it's been mostly for me where I lead portfolio and where I lead clients is just having an area that I'm experienced and kind of can focus on. Mm -hmm. And again, if, if that wasn't the case, then many people could make the argument, this isn't the place to invest in this exact moment. So I apply that even down to lo lo locale and, and in specific cities and just kind of ride with what I'm familiar with, where I know there's other benefits, you know, like easier access to getting permits and approvals and stuff like that. Yep. Um, Very important. So it works, it works for me. That's yes. what works for me. But, but to, to kind of respond to your point, I, I could argue for me, yep. I'm a bit of a product of, of the conversations that I've had with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And when I put out the idea of covering expenses on your investment, knowing there's opportunities in all of them, and it's covering your expense at the end of the year, you could refinance, you get all your money back, you're ahead of the game. Nine times out of 10, they're not cool with that. Right. Even even investors that do have large portfolios. So for me, it's become a gut response, just like it is to invest in Ontario, to say, we're going to get you cash flow. Exactly. And if it's not in this specific neighborhood, we're going to go further out. And yes, Toronto is going to have massive immigration. Canada overall is going to have massive immigration. But, the, but so too is the outskirt communities. They're also going to benefit from that. So... You can't just say because this is going to do well, therefore I'm going to invest in here because there's many places that are going to do really well. And I'd like to do it having 500 bucks in my pocket. A hundred percent. I mean, right. if, if I mean, I myself, if I had to make a choice now where I am in my investing career, I can also stomach more, right? I can, I can, exactly. I can look at saying, look, and I don't mean that from a financial perspective only. Like if I had to even look at a student housing yeah. I don't know, circa friggin' 10 years ago, there's no way you're getting me into a student housing because I'm not dealing with the kids and I get the property managers and all that kind of stuff. You can have it managed. But at the end of the day, it all falls on me. It's, it's my property. The, the property manager, and I've been through 20 of them, um, they, some of them, like, they just suck in all honesty. I, I just have not, like, overall, it's not their property. It's yours. So you have to take on all that burden where now I can deal, I can deal with some students. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I kind of, I kind of know what to do up front in terms of setting it up, hopefully for a win, stacking the cards in my favor. You said Niagara, man. What do you like? Like what, what is it about Niagara that you're, you're liking? I like, for me, it's proximity to the GTA. Um, I have had certain markets in particular, Welland as an example, which just allow any single family to convert into a triplex. So they're very investor friendly. Um, I like Brantford. I like areas that are kind of encouraging to investors. I mean, one of the things that gets me right now is look at, I don't know if you've seen all the ads in Alberta, right? They're yeah, trying to drive I mean, everyone there. That yeah. is a province that is driving investors and wants you there. Yep. But then you look at a place like Nova Scotia, right? And it's like, we're not going to let you, we're going to put these new caps in place. They're trying to push it away. Um, Ontario is very good at pushing away overall, but mm -hmm. when it comes to specific cities, there are others that are doing better than others. And, and again, to me, it's keeping all of these properties within kind of proximity. That's how I've been really focused. Now, obviously what's been going on this year has halted a lot of that. Um, but I'm expecting in the next little bit, um, once we get some kind of clarity on that specific segment, they haven't been actually nearly as hit, by the way, these outskirt communities, some of them like Fort Erie, as an example, has gone up in price when everything else is just crashing. Um, but like big cities like Hamilton, Toronto, yeah, like you're getting pummeled. So I, that I don't think is maybe the best market in the world. But yeah. when I run my numbers on things like population inflow, like I, I did my obviously research on figuring out where that. So you do population inflow and um, past history of gains and um, job employment and stuff like that. These, those are what drove, drove me to these specific segments. And what do you think is driving up the rental market? Because I know you said, you know, the Hamiltons and the Torontos in values have, have decreased, yeah. but we've seen the exact opposite happening on rents though, yeah. right? And so what's your take on I, that? I called that out at the beginning of the year. People can check my predictions this year. I, I first off, rents were below. In fact, I think they still are where they were pre-COVID. They mm -hmm. might have just crossed. Um, in so Toronto, we they due. just crossed. We were due. Toronto, yeah. We were really due. Now, the prediction of what rents were going to come back on, there was an understanding it was going to rise, but not that much. 
And in fact, it's actually outperforming what I thought. So now I look like just like a true gangster, like haven't <laughs> predicted that. But you can see that you could see that coming in the way again, back to like months of inventory, what's available. The, the biggest thing I think in my mind is the running away of investors. The running away of investors and what's available for rent makes so much sense, right? You've got like, who wants a 2% cap rate, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So that has pushed many people out. Meanwhile, you've got other areas that are pulling. So they're going to the polls, they're running away from the GTA. And I just see the writing on the wall in the short term of renters are gonna pay the price of that. Inflation is costing us so much in the cost of housing and to run our homes. I love properties that are you know all inclusive rent to avoid those things. But generally, if you're on a variable rate mortgage, God, these people are going to be, they're gonna be squeezing renters to, mm -hmm. if they have their op opportunity yep. to cover the cost of the variable rate mortgage grabbing as much as possible out of that and either leaving and creating more of a vacuum and, you know, or bumping up the rent in which you as a tenant are going to pay the price because I did. Like we're sharing the price. COVID was a huge precursor to all of this. You know, you, you're, you're safe at home. We can't kick you out. What a great time to be a renter. What a great time to get opportunities to find rentals. And I was telling renters at that time, mm -hmm. lock in long-term. You can get three, four year rental, do it, right? Cause this was, this makes sense. Cause the direct rebound is okay. Landlord tenant board starts opening up. Goodbye. 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 We're moving on and we're selling. We're, we're not getting them out to replace them. We're, we're done. And just the cost. I mean, if you just look at the cost of borrowing for somebody who's a renter and they haven't purchased before and they're going to become a first time home buyer, shit just got real expensive for them. They, if they were on the fence, they're no longer on the fence anymore. They're going to be renting for a little bit longer because we also know not everyone has, you know, 10 per, forget the 20% as an investor union, but as a first time home buyer, yeah, you can buy as little as 5% down, but yeah. lenders are looking closer to 10, right? Like yeah. that makes the more getting the mortgage a little bit easier where now you're just, you're seeing more renters in the marketplace that as an investor, look, I got to say, I love that. Because at least I can recoup some of these some of these uh, uh, increasing costs as well, that's right? It. Yep, that's it. And and I mean, if the landlord had it his way, the rents would go through the roof no matter what. But tenants got a break this year. Mm -hmm. You think about it, the caps that got a break for two years, really. Okay, so <laughs> right, like if we think about COVID as well, like I mean, we we're, we're putting behind the. It's kind of like the guy that you know, inflation goes up ten, you negotiate a salary of two. Yeah, I mean, I'm forever behind. <laughs> yes, right, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. happened in the way of the the man, the ability to increase the rent. Not to mention, you got people running into short term rentals as much as possible, and. There's just, it's just a, I don't know what, what, I guess the bounce back question, and a lot of this is psychological. Maybe it's not all math. I, I'm not even a big into math. I like numbers, but I don't, it's not all of it. Yeah. What factor is there to bring rents down? Is there one? What factor is there to bring rents down? More housing. Okay. But there's not more housing. Exactly. The, that's the so only that thing would that, be, would, that would be, but that's not the, the circumstances. That's that the only thing that. In fact, you have things I would not see, closing. You've yeah. got purpose-built buildings that were like amazing 10-year plan goals. Yeah. Gone with the wind. And look, I mean, in a, I actually think Toronto specifically is going to become more and more of a renter city. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. we're there already. I, like, set five years ago, seven years ago, I was yelling from the rooftops, yeah. like, from an, like, to investors. Guys, invest, invest here, invest here. Like, you're... The average person's not going to be able to buy here anymore. We are already starting to see that more and more, especially in the last 18 months or so, 24 months. But look, I think it's hard for people in Toronto to just recognize that we're a world-class city. It Like, I get we have a lot of downsides. Our transit compared to the other major cities is, is, is not, you know, up to par. But people want to come here. Like, they want to come to our country. They want to come to our city. There is... Still, and it, look, I, it happened in Montreal back in the late 70s, I guess it was mid 70s. Um, the major corporations left there. I don't see that shit happening in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Like people are coming back to work. So we have the, all the, we have our Bay Street here. We have some of the best schools here. I'm not a school guy, so I wouldn't like, I'm not sure if the ratings are still as high for the Ryersons and the UFTs and the Yorks and all that kind of stuff. But 
Um, and then we have a booming tech sector that not a lot of people really speak about. Um, yeah, you know, so, so, so there's some layoffs lately with, recently, sorry, with, with Shopify, um, but I see that all coming back. I mean, Toronto is still a place. And when I say Toronto, I really mean the GTA, because you got to include the Mississaugas of the world there, right? And Hamilton, for me, I'm, I, I know it's not right in the GTA, but I'll call it the GTHA. Um, you got $4 billion dollars being pumped in by all levels of government. Look, I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not, nowhere near an economist. But when I see $4 billion being pumped into an, a region, I got my eyes open because I know that that is a place where people are going to be. Yeah. And as an investor, that's what we want to look at. But to your question, brother, man, like, yeah, like I, I, the only thing that I see that stops rentals like from increasing the, at the rate that they are is obviously... I never ever saw a pandemic coming, but is more housing? Like we need more supply, but that's kind of so. So I mean, basic economics, and I also am not a you know I'm not I'm not. A you don't try to play one on your podcast. I get it. No, I don't. Play, <laughs> I play one on a podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um. You need so you've got two factors. You've got supply, which is mostly talked about, but you have demand, right? And the demand has been the one that's getting beaten up the most. I would say. Supply, I mean, we put condos in the sky like no other city. So why are we fighting on a supply front? We're winning the supply front, right? I think- Well, hang on though. And when you say we're winning on the supply front, I don't know if we are compared to the demand that's coming in. Right, but again, demand. Right. So, so maybe the demand is too high, not the supply is too low. I'm not looking to put any policy ideas here forward. I'm just saying that when I'm sitting back as an investor and I'm looking at the way things are lined up, the cards are so stacked on that side to the point where you can make a case, just like your portfolio, many others will do the same that, yeah, I'm not getting cash flow, but long term equity is the play. Equity is the play long term. If you look mathematically, you're going to get ahead on an equity front. You don't want to forfeit that either. And so you're going to have a lot of people hedging their bets, taking losses in the sense of cash flow, but still maintaining a level of expenses. But what happens? when you don't cover your expenses? Are people still gonna buy into that with you know, the idea of potential growth? I think less. I think there's gonna be less people who buy into that, for sure. I think that's already happening. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I see and, that anyways. Well, you see yeah. it just with, look, I know we're talking about not math, but I mean, you just see it from the fact that we're down by sales 41%. That's not yeah. all investors, that's all type of real estate. And I, it's a very vague uh, 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 number to use, but you're right. I mean, we're, we're seeing it already. I just think that there's still a place for the fact that you can, you can, if you got your shit together, meaning like you're, you're someone who does save money, that A, that there's tons of opportunities out there. You're seeing them, I'm seeing them. But if you know that you can bring your expenses down, like, and you can live a little bit more, you know, under your means, and hold on to the property, to your point about equity, you're gonna win in the long term, man. And to, to kind of segue a little too, when we're yeah. talking about incomes, right? You talk about higher jobs coming back. From an economics perspective, again, not an economics major, but I did pretty good in economics in high school. Increasing wages is a driver of inflation, right? The more of these regulations we're at, we're actually driving more inflation. Meanwhile, you have the Bank of Canada just pouring on the fire, trying to cool it down with interest rate increases. So we're, when we're talking about interest rate increases, the reason that you can kind of anticipate there would be at least today and probably more to come, um, many have said that's it, we're not gonna do it for a while, but the reason they're saying it is because they feel like we can't do it. Um, but if the Bank of Canada have its way and the, the unions aren't listening to them and saying stop negotiating on behalf of your workers and the wages continue to rise, this fight against inflation, if the Bank of Canada is as serious as it seems to be, the interest rates are gonna keep going up. Mm -hmm. So though you see some segments right now where prices have upticked, you gotta be very careful with going on the air and saying, that's it, that's the bottom. And I, I love going on and saying that's the bottom. Right. I love those podcasts. Yeah. But you wanna be very clear with, this is the bottom, but, and mm -hmm. understand what the repercussions are. And oftentimes what I've seen in my career is biggest consequences to a market have been government intervention or some kind of economic policy. That's, that's really what does it. And yeah. that's, which is psychological. Well. And when you, you said the word psychological earlier and in, 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 in economics, I think they use the term consumer confidence, right? Like that's where we start to get an idea of, okay, like what's really happening in there? Like what's happening in terms of, are people putting their hands in their pocket and not spending money? Um, which obviously like 
with these next next increases that might have happened at the time you know that this podcast gets aired we're gonna know a little bit more so we're you and i are gonna be able to go off in the comments as well i think that's gonna be fun um i was going somewhere in terms of um the interest rate hikes you said inflation the other thing and you, you spoke about bank of canada yes that they can keep increasing rates the other thing that i'm actually scared of because they have one other one other tool in their to in their toolbox to fix this which is unfortunately the why we're in this problem in my opinion is by printing more money because historically that's what they've done yeah as well like not just bank of canada all countries at some point to actually ease inflation is pump even more money into the system yeah. and that is going to be scary if they start to pump another like look what do they do in the last two years alone i think they pump they printed more money than they printed like in the last 40 years combined some numbers some stat like that i was reading i know that's probably no, no, I, I, you're, you're, I believe that's accurate right like I, I, that like might that, that might have been more of an american stat but we, we're, we're kind of right around them um that is scary man if they start to print more money um, we're just we're, look as much as I hate the increase of rates and I'm talking for my clients I'm speaking for myself personally I think that we need to bite the bullet right now like this is like like 0.75 back in um, September and and I think we might see another 0.5 one whatever it might be we need to get to a place where we find out like what is the equilibrium here like what's the balance of supply and demand because a lot of it is we, we we've been through a very frothy market not just in real estate but with just pricing of everything right yeah. and i don't know if we figured out what that equilibrium is yeah i mean i was reading in the articles talking about inflation and the changes they made this actually would put us in quote unquote an equilibrium in not creating or stimulating demand but also not you know the other side where we would have like recession and issues and stuff like that. But I, I just, I'm, you're speaking the same language as me, right? Like as a person who owns properties, inflation is great at transferring wealth to people that own properties, but at the some rich get richer, but at Shit some point yeah. you have to recognize that if we can't have a country that runs like that and there's, I have kids and it matters. And, and so the language two years ago for me, even on my podcast significantly changed when I see an article that says, homes have now become more affordable for, for first time buyers. That excites me um, because that is at least a glimmer of hope. And one of the things that I said when the market was crashing in 2022, the beginning of this year before interest rates dropped is, I believe home prices were gonna drop because we want them to. Like even wealthy people, people with significant portfolios, they want prices to come down. This is absurd. We're still up year over year. Like, oh, I mean, one thing that scares me about Alberta, which always has scared me about Alberta, is the massive peaks and valleys it has. Yeah. Ontario's not really known for that. Except we just went through it. What was it, 21%, 22% a couple of years on ago? On an increase? On, on an increase. It was like like back in- You uh, mean peak 20, prices? 2020 to 2021, I think Jeez, we saw some an increase. some segments of, of, over 30%. Well, yeah, but uh, I'm just, let's just use the average, for example, yeah, in the GT. I think we're at like 20 around, around, like, right? Yeah. I was scared shitless because you know something, it's not sustainable, no. right? And to your point as an investor, like, yeah, I want them to come down so I can go buy more as well. Like I, I don't, I'm not happy with like where, where they've increased so much. Um, man, with Alberta, that's what actually scares me about that province. Do you ever go out there? Like, is that something I, that you- I haven't touched Alberta as far as investing, but yeah. I just, I find it fascinating the draw that it has. Same with Florida, right? It's just interesting the draw that it's bringing. And and this draw has been going on for over a year. I People like are just Florida. seeing it now. What's your thing about Florida? Like, what's your thoughts? I just don't touch the US. You don't, just don't, it's yeah. It's not my thing. If there's one place that um, I like is, it is Florida, to be honest with you, um, because um, I, I, I like what they've done, man. I like what they did um, in terms of how aggressive they were with, with keeping things open. Um, I also like the fact that right now their governor um, is is someone that that has always welcomed businesses. Um, I like the fact, not necessarily because they're more of a red or 
red state than a blue state or anything of that sort um, because I don't really play in either. I just like what actually happened, yeah. right? Um, I li also like to see that they have a similar problem that we have here in the GTA, that they don't have enough supply. Um, and look, in the States anyways, the people spoke. And what I mean by that is the action that they took with leaving a lot of the states and going yeah. into Florida. The entire United States moved to Florida. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, man. And and it's it's quite easy to understand why. No friggin' income tax. Like, you know, that that's a big driver, man. That's so, a big driver. So we had something similar to that during COVID where the entire downtown core moved to the suburbs. Um, the repercussions, and I'm not saying this is the case for Florida, nor do I know any of the numbers to make this claim. But what I do know is that at some point it will become too much. And, and so they end up being the segments that are hurt the most on the kickback. So if you're, why I say I've been seeing these articles for a year is generally you gotta be in first. Like if you're gonna do it, you gotta get the, like who buy, who's buying crypto now, right? Like you gotta get there first. Once the word is out, it's too late. Um, like, and, and it's, com it's comedy to see when they're reporting on what's going on in the market because it's always, it appears to always be so late. I'm like, I, I don't understand how you're just figuring this out. Like, I'm on a bit of a hiatus right now on my podcast. Actually, my last episode I shot was in June. So this is my first recording coming back now. And uh, I was calling the market was crashing before I left. Like, I've got episodes talking about is dropping, dropping, dropping. Never had been reported yet on Treb, but now we're getting the news two months later. What are you looking at that, like when you say Treb is late, yeah. and like what are you looking at in terms of stats and stuff? Where are you getting some Good of your question. stuff from? So there are media sources online easily reporting daily. Like you have daily sources. Uh, I, I like how Sigma is a quick flip um, to jump on and just see what's going on. You have to be careful on some of the stats because they haven't fully added up to the end of the year and they're not always 100% accurate, mm. but it gives you an image. I also like, uh, I have other people that I follow on Twitter that are very good at giving weekly updates. Got it. Whether that's rentals or, so and is that those are the ones that I focus Ontario on. Ontario-based, ca Canada? Yeah, Toronto, or, GTA. GTA, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so knowing number of sales. So like in, a, in certain months, it's critical. And this is why these are the times you really can exceed the, the, the market or Excel will be on the market is let's say you have a mark uh, halfway through the month, I guess, March, March, 2022, let's say, right. You've got the first 15 days of the month. And then all of a sudden you've got this shift that happened, COVID lockdowns. Mm -hmm. Are we going to wait two weeks to figure out what's going on? No, that immediately within that next week, we saw what was going on. So you start reporting it. That's when I'm calling my clients. But when is everyone else calling their clients? Halfway through April. Right, that, well, right? at least April 5th or 6th when the tribes come up. But like, yep. yeah. Yep. So so you're too late. You missed it. Because how long does it take you to list the house? Yep. Right? So you're just watching. So whether you look at it as a, your responsibility as a salesperson, if you're on the real estate side or as an investor, I think all around, yes, time in the market wins long term. That's the way it goes, especially in high inflationary. But there's talk of deflation too. So who knows? Yeah, but in in the long term, with the type of currency we run on, running inflation hot, two percent as at least like it's like we like it, like it's like an addiction to have inflation because it generates wealth. But in in all of these things, like I lost my point, I lost my train of thought. That's well, I was gonna, you know, you said something about crypto. Um, do you have any money in that world? Yeah, I, I threw you threw a little bucks, bit of something here and there. Um, yeah, what, what's kind of your overall thesis around? Oh, that? no, it's it's a it's a joke. And, I've always thought it was a joke. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything about when you say it's kind of a joke? Yeah, that's um, a broad. That's very broad. No, no, no. It's okay. Because like, I'm, I don't off the, I'm a little off the cuff. I don't do, <laughs> as you fucking should be. So am I, buddy. Um, I told you, I don't do any homework or anything. For these things. I just go. Um, my my thoughts on it, um, and I would love to get your takes on your take on it, buddy, is that I think there is going to be a place for it mm. where people start to realize that maybe our money's not as safe in the banks than as we originally thought. Right. Right, um, where the the decentralization of it is, it's it was almost like a matter of time that we needed to do it. My concern about it is when I look at the the the, the superpowers to be, and unfortunately, Canada's not in that conversation. And I love this country, love this country, 
but we're not a superpower by any means. So when I look at the States, China, and Russia, I just can't see them laying down and taking this crypto Bitcoin conversation laying down. You know what I mean? Like, I can't see them making it easy for myself and Parsa and Yas and you to trade in crypto without them having a hand in it. And yeah. that's what scares me about it. But man, do I like the decentralization aspect of it. If decentralization is what's best for the global economy, I, I think it will win out. I, I do. In the sense that, I mean, you there's a lot of things. Oil companies don't want electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, is what, I mean, heck, electric vehicles go water vehicles, right? right. At some point, <laughs> the market will win out. I agree with the laying down, and I believe crypto has its place in that decentralization argument. I just think we're too early for at sure. seeing what will win out. I know you're a fan of Gary Vee and he likes to look at what's early, right? For like sure. What comes ahead. And I just think throwing, because when I throw it in, I, you know, I throw a Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I think I, uh, what, I forgot the Elon Musk one. I threw one in there too, just for fun. What's the Elon Musk one? You guys know that? But anyways, this is just, I'm just, just play money. Just we're, throw it in. We're right? going to see if our boy Parcel is a good fact checker. Dogecoin. Dogecoin, yeah. Oh, so right. Dogecoin's going Doge. nuts. Oh, okay, I'll buy it, you yeah. know, throw a little bit. Yeah. The, the I, I mean, we're in real estate because we like semi-sure bets and yeah. Bitcoin or any crypto is definitely not a sure bet in the specific vehicle of investing. That doesn't mean there won't be a world of decentralization. I think you'll probably see a changeover from the US dollar into some other currency first. I think we've got too much of a runway to be speculating or jumping into crypto right now. hundred percent. Um and when you say like another currency, are you talking about like another country's currency? Potentially. I yeah. I think yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, right? And, and a part of that could be not wanting to roll over. The U.S. would much rather go off a maybe anybody but Russian's currency. 100%. I mean, well, anybody, that, we're not going down, laying down, but yeah. in, in avoidance of crypto. Like it's just such a, such a fatal Well, unless blow. they figure out how they get their And they're already researching it. how to yes. tag it into what's going on. Like, For sure. Like if, so, if you have a Bank of Canada crypto, even if it has zero of the components of the current crypto market will sell over on Canadians easier than the For actual sure. benefits of well, crypto. We, and we're going to think we're all tech savvy. Like it's like you, you open up the real estate's a joke in this way too, right? You open up, Oh, we got COVID. We need to do electronic signatures. Oh, look at how high tech we are. We're doing electronic signatures. So it's like, okay, <laughs> welcome to the party. And it took them, it took them only 57 years to like actually <laughs> accept it. And now, and then it was normal. Um, your real estate practice, brother, um, 10 years, um, obviously, me getting to know you a little bit more now through this podcast, um, even more than when you hosted me, um, I could tell why you've been successful. Um, but somebody getting into the business right now, um, what's what's some things that you would say, look, um, Mary, Joe, you have to do these two, three things if you're getting into the business Jeez. right now. Um, first of all, Take what I say with a grain of salt, because I'm an old fart at this point. No offense, guys. Um, when I first started, farming, cold calling, door knocking was the game. Open houses, ex expo or um, expiries. What do they call them? Fizbos and expiries. Fizbos and expiries. Thank yeah. you. If that was the game, I would be long gone from the game. I made a decision early on when I first got licensed, though that was what was taught to me. I said, if that is what real estate is, it's not what I want to do. Um, but I realized farming a warm market of eight to 10,000 people is better suited and better done online. This was way before podcast was a thing. This was happening for me on Facebook live and be getting my face out there, creating content. I think the world is changing. I think things are evolving. The same truths of businesses and other aspects of sales would definitely apply to real estate. So find what works for you, find an avenue. A lot of people say, you know, it's the right articles and maybe there are people that make money writing articles, but I think that there is more opportunity personally in video or voice. That's my, that's my opinion. I would encourage realtors pretty or ugly to get their face on camera or their voice out there. I mean, you got one or the other, right? Yeah. Um, Oh, some people are talented with a nice voice. I think I have a nice, like, I don't think I have the sexiest voice, but Yas <laughs> tells me while he edits me, he's like, you have a very nice voice. How many times have you said that? Zero. Okay, <laughs> just making sure, just making sure we're still on the same page. Yes. Um, 
first time you went on Facebook Live or did a video. Jeez. Um, insecurities, oh, scared shitless. Oh God, if people, can, like, if people oh, want it, this. they can send me a message. I'll send to them. It's the most embarrassing thing. Yeah. I was in a rental unit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hadn't yet renovated at all. So it had literally... This is crazy, but the colors in the unit were the Indian flag colors. <laughs> the living room was green. Oh, I got it. The kitchen was orange. Orange, yeah. So I'm sitting in the rental property, unlived in, because it's like my only office studio opportunity, sitting in front of an old white fridge with a towel hanging out of it, a got green it. towel, bright yeah. as can be. That's my got background. It. Got it. In the background. Yeah. And just talking about relationships, because I didn't know what else to talk about. What do you mean relationships? Like what? Like yeah, it was just like how relationships help you in the real estate industry. So just creating content. So you're talking to agents? No, I was just, it. I was in this, this wasn't a Facebook Live. This was a Facebook that I uploaded. This is before Facebook Live. Right. So, so it, it translated into Facebook Live when that became available. And, okay. And then I, I jumped through there. I went into, fa I've, I've gone all the way around. I, I've gone into Facebook groups. So I started sharing, overexposing the Facebook algorithms by sharing it and just absolutely demolishing groups. I never really jumped too far into Instagram, but I, even now I like to post stories. So I kind of did yeah. that. TikTok today is behind, I, I've already established my business apart from TikTok, but TikTok would be where I would be looking if I were just to start now. For sure. And then I somehow by miracle, well, I guess YouTube as well. And by miracle landed because of my assistance recommendation in podcast and timing. I got lucky with timing. COVID happened and I had uploaded the first five episodes. And now I told all my clients that I'm not working essentially. Time to start recording. And yeah. every single day we recorded for the first three months. I mean, and I had a hundred episodes within the first. What do you love months. about podcasting, man? Because uh, I love speaking to other podcast hosts because yeah. if I tell you it changed my business, it's such an understatement. Yeah. This has changed my life, like completely changed the course of my life. Um, and I like, I love podcasting. What has it done for you? The biggest thing that I've personally got out of it is credibility. That's it. I get to talk to you. Yeah. You say yes when I invite you on my show. 100%. Right? I couldn't do that on YouTube. And to add to that and, and to kind of speak to the current climate and where I've benefited from this, as I was saying to some of your guys here when I walked in, this is the first face-to-face -face interview I've ever done. Ever? Since doing podcast. Fuck, you would have fooled me, man. So, I mean, I can speak. Yep. You know? Um but I have benefited from interviewing people from across Canada or across Ontario that would never come see me, but they just came and saw me on Zoom and I recorded it. Yeah. So very similar. So like I know people, like some people reach out to me and say, Jazz, I don't got a place to do in person now. Look, is in person the best? Yes, it 100% is. You and I can cut each other off. There's like, you know what I mean? We got this eye contact. You can feel the energy. There, there, there's definite benefits to it. Don't let that be an excuse though. No. To oh. like saying, I'm not going to do Zoom. Because I, I, I did it with you on Zoom. I've done 212 on Zoom in the last yep. 24 months or something like that. Like I watch ones on Zoom. I mean, one of the fa my favorite Zoom videos in the last year for sure is Ray Dalio and Anthony Robbins. And they do a lot of in-person stuff, but they did this on Zoom. And yeah, like... It glitched a few times when Ray Dalio was talking, but if the content's good, you don't give a shit. You're going to sit there well, and Well, this is, I, I would take that thought and I would add it the entire way through. People, if you're watching video, yes. Who wants to watch a freaking Zoom video? We're over it. Yeah. But if you're listening to audio, I would make the argument for me personally, I don't care. I personally don't care. Right. I, I think as long as you've got the content, just like I don't care if there's a little bit of a, as long as you, you know, you don't have the super big P's and like all the things yeah, that yeah, yeah, ruin yeah, yeah. Yeah. episodes. Um, where I think we overcomplicated as content creators is adding video. For me, man, I'd be putting out probably twice, this sounds crazy, but be, maybe I can get your input on this. I'd be putting out twice the episodes if it was audio only. A thousand but percent. because of the video component, it slows me down in that I gotta, I gotta, you know, put on a shirt. A thousand percent. I like you should, if you like, if you're thinking, should you just go like, maybe you just do your video podcast and that comes out once every two weeks once every week so i was do? i was doing them weekly or bi-weekly okay perfect and then weeks, and then if you if you just have an audio like if you know that sorry you can do more yeah just put out those audios on the yeah, platforms the, man. i I've, i go back and forth on it though yeah, because spotify has got video and i'm uploading my video content i've got the video ability yeah i'm good on camera yeah so i feel like i'm leaving that on the table yeah, but then, and then the YouTube you might stop. is an audience. There 100%, is I have an audience 100%. on that platform. My concern is is that if you can do more, 
then don't stop yourself and just throw it out on yeah. the audio, man. Because you you got I was you got doing them the daily by audio. You jump yeah. to video and you get once a week is a lot of work. It's hard, a hundred percent. We had to push to once every two weeks because we wanted to. And to your point, I love what you said. We did overcomplicate it, you know. But I got this burning sensation, and every time I do, I just go ahead with it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. There's 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 an acronym up here that says RFA, which is ready, fire, aim, and that to me, I live by it. Like I'm just gonna pull the trigger and figure out what happens. But I got this burning sensation right now to go once a week with this again because yeah, i did you should go once a week your well, algorithms go way up i was at once a week yeah. for i can't remember how long that's why when i said years. i'm taking a break i had the three my three month old and i'm just like well i didn't do one this week i'm not i this is selfish but that selfish is why it's successful i will only do the podcast if i want to yeah i've had people reach out to me and say hey well i'll, I'll take the i'll host it i'll take the, i'm like you can't no. it's mine I, it has to be guaranteed. I'll, I will stop the podcast before I will give it away. Oh, and oh, I, I, to me, I can't <laughs> look. I, I don't want to knock anybody else who maybe like has all. The, and I've been on I've been on other people's podcasts. It's like you know the 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 Jazz Tackar podcast, for example. But it's somebody else hosting it. Yeah. I've, I've done that. I've been on people's podcasts yeah. like that, and it's like at least it's something, and you're doing. Yeah. I'm like you. There's no friggin way someone's hosting my podcast when i go knock on wood the team knows shut everything down and move on and go do something else you know what i mean but there's no way somebody else can take my name or take my my this is like a, i have two boys i have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old this is my third child man like i this has been now going on to coming on to anyways four years um as I mentioned, it's changed the course of my life. I get to meet people like yourself um, and I can talk about whatever. It's why I actually moved everything to more of like what's known as an OTT, like an app now, okay. because I'm thinking kind of five years down the road and yeah. saying, okay, uh, I might start saying some stuff or some of my guests might come on and say some stuff and there's a lot of canceling happening out there. Well, with, that's fair. And I and even when I started the show, I, I a big component, we didn't even talk about this, People that follow my show will know humor is the thing. Like, unless if I have a, if I have a guest on, I mean, we're not funny. Like, no. but if I can pre looking, decide maybe. what me. I'm going to say, I'm pretty funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so those those aspects of it, I have had jokes in the past where I'm just saying I could lose my real estate license. Yeah. Um, because of this canceling culture you're talking about, and I mean, I've pulled back because of the notoriety a little bit. Right. But. Yeah, that's a thought. And and so every episode that is published, your I look at it like my license is on the line. And if I lose my license, am I okay with that? Right. And I think, yes, I am. No problem. Well, it's a nice place to be at, yeah. my friend. Um, I'm so happy that you were able to come do this in person. Um, I truly mean it. Like for us to be the first one, um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see where our relationship is going to go, man. Um, I'm, it makes sense that you said your first video was that, that you did ever that just talking about relationships. Cause I've, I've got an opportunity to meet some really, really cool people. Um, and some of those relationships go somewhere and some of them don't, but the ones that have, um, man, like got businesses growing with people we have other collaborations we're doing and so i'm very i'm looking forward to seeing what you and i might be able to do together um to 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 the viewers and listeners that are in business i can't stress this enough the second you have an abundance mentality and say to yourself there is more than enough to go around wow do the resources the money the right people start really showing up in your life because you've made the decision that you're not going to be living in a scarcity mindset. So Bradley, thank you so much for joining me today, buddy. I love it. My pleasure. Great. Job. Thanks for having me. For sure.